Good to see everyone. Welcome to Yale. Uh, welcome to Yale School of Management. It's great to have students, faculty, uh, staff, friends from around the global network to mark this, the third anniversary of the Global Network for Advanced Management. And a special welcome to people who are joining live from around the world. We're very pleased that this event is part of the R. Peter Strauss Class of 1944 lecture series on press, public responsibility, and global issues. Anyone who listens to Fareed Zakaria, reads his columns, uh, knows that he brings insights to an astounding range of big issues. Fareed Zakaria GPS on CNN reaches more than 200 million homes in over 210 countries. His columns in The Atlantic and The Washington Post reach over 25 million readers weekly. His books, The Future of Freedom and The Post-American World, have been New York Times bestsellers and have been translated into over 25 languages. His recently published, that's what he's signing, in defense of a liberal education is already number six on the New York Times bestseller list. Fareed Zakari is so well known um, that maybe I should stop, but I feel like I ought to spend a little more time introducing him. Born in India, and, and as described in his recent book, he decided in favor of a liberal education in the US, and Yale College won the coin toss. He later earned a PhD in government from Harvard. From 1992 to 2000, he was managing editor of foreign affairs. He spent the next 10 years as editor of Newsweek International. Fareed Zakaria GPS, an acronym for Global Public Square, received a Peabody Award, the most prestigious award in electronic media. In describing his approach to engaging the most influential leaders in the world, the Peabody stated, with wide ranging background knowledge and a keen sense of immediately important of the immediately important, he engages these guests in a manner that provides viewers with rich and nuanced perspective. I am a huge fan. I learned from his efforts to understand Iran, to look hard at US educational issues, and rigorously critique policy on whether it's constructive, sufficiently constructive, or too reactive. And I particularly enjoy, and I, I've picked up on this as I've watched him over the years, that he brings a sense of awe and wonder to the dizzying world of science and innovation and all the future that might lie before us. His famous, you know, let's get started is an invitation to learning. So before I turn uh, to Fareed for opening remarks, which will be followed by dialogue with, with you and others, I do want to make sure that everyone knows the basics about the Global Network for Advanced Management. The, the network is now comprised of 27 schools uh, from around the world. It represents a shift away from the partnership model and a dominant focus on tuition-rich markets. Member schools seek learning by engaging in in the network uh, in a variety of programs. It runs on the principles of diffuse reciprocity and mutual respect. The underlying premise is that we need to appreciate the complexities among societies and how they operate. We're very much still early in the development of the global network. Um, last month we had 650 master's level students move around the world across 18 different schools. We've had a lot of students participate in our small network online courses. Tomorrow, the seventh meeting of the Global Network Deans and Directors convenes at Hitotsubashi in Tokyo. Uh, that's, uh, as you might uh, have figured out, that's uh, in Japan. Uh, we haven't met there. We've met in a lot of interesting places to date. Recently, seven Global Network teams participated in an integrated leadership co case competition. Congratulations to the winning team from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Next week, 
Former Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner will preside over the finals of the Yale Geithner Challenge. Teams from across the network produce videos exploring the causes and management, excuse me, the causes of the worldwide financial crisis. And today we continue with our own global public square lower case as we mark, as I said, the third anniversary of the Global Network for Advanced Management. So please join me in welcoming Fareed Zakaria. Thank you so much. It is a huge pleasure to be here. Um, I, have, I have to say I am completely envious of you uh, in being in this, uh, in this extraordinary building. I was on the Yale Corporation when it was, uh, when it was approved, uh, and I had no idea, honestly, uh, how, how beautiful it would be. It is one of those rare architectural uh, buildings where the actual uh, building looks nicer than the architectural designs and drawings and models because of the, the light and the glass. So it's a huge pleasure to be here. Um, what I thought I'd do is just talk for a little while before we open it up to questions about the world that, uh, that we are all looking at and ask some basic questions about it. Ask, you know, wh where are we going? Where does it seem to be heading? What are the dominant trend lines? And if you were to look at the news, certainly you would think that the do dominant trend lines are violence, mayhem, destruction, death, Right, you're, you're looking at what's going on in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, the, off the coast of Libya. And it does appear that the world is dominated by bad news, violence, um, terrorism. And there is some important reality to it. Uh, and it's important to understand, I think, why it's happening across this vast swath of the world, which is the greater Middle East. Uh, because what has really happened in that world is an order, a settled order, uh, has been upended, has been destroyed. And so if you look at the region from Libya in North Africa to Syria, um, and you can even extend it uh, for, further beyond that, but let's just take a look at that vast region of, of the world. What you notice is 30 or 40 years ago, this was a very stable part of the world in the sense that governments were in place, they controlled uh, the, the area, there weren't a great many interstate wars taking place uh, there, there were certainly some moments of, of, of tension and conflict, but by and large the Middle East looked pretty much the way it had, you know, it had it looked for decade after decade. And the reason was you had in place throughout this area fairly powerful dictatorships that kept, these, kept, that kept this imperial system in, in place. And I call it an imperial system because these dictators all had external support. It originated with the colonial powers, Britain and France carving up the old Ottoman Empire and creating much of the modern Middle East. There's this wonderful anecdote uh, in the last, last Sunday's Wall Street Journal where the French Prime Minister, uh, President uh, Clemenceau is walking, taking a walk with the British Prime Minister David Lloyd George at the end of one of the conferences after the First World War when they are carving up the Ottoman Empire. And Lloyd George looks like he's in a bad mood. They've had a, they've had a tough negotiation session. And Clemenceau says to him, what is it you want? And Lloyd George looks at him and says, Mosul, I want Mosul. Mosul being the second largest city in what is now Iraq. Um, Mosul was meant to be part of Syria, which was going to be French. Iraq was, was British. And Clemenceau says to David Lloyd George, you can have Mosul. And they went back in and they redrew the line. And therefore, Mosul is now in Iraq, not in Syria. It gives you a feel for just how uh, in one spasm the modern Middle East was created. So first you had the imperial sponsors, then you had the superpower sponsors. And these regimes, with that backing, maintained order in their, in their countries with an iron grip. They were all dictatorships or monarchies. They were, for the most part, very secular. 
Think of the way that a Gaddafi or a Saddam Hussein or an Assad dressed. They were wore Western military uniforms or Western business suits. This was not uh, you know, meant to be some kind of uh, Middle Eastern uh, version of uh, you know, a kind of locally authentic regime. These were westernizing, secularizing, highly repressive uh, rulers. That order has essentially been entirely overturned. And it has been overturned for a variety of reasons. It's been overturned because of demographic realities. Uh, the Middle East is about 65% of the Middle East is under the age of 30. And whenever you have youth bulges in history, you have trouble. The French Revolution was preceded by a youth bulge. The Iranian Revolution was preceded by a youth bulge. Even in the United States, if you ask yourself, what was the peak year of violence, internal violence within the United States, it is 1969. The peak year for America's demographic boom was 1968. So wherever you see these kind of youth bulges, you have some unrest. You have the reality of economic stagnation in most of these countries. You have the reality of extraordinary technological change that has empowered people. You know that story well. And all these things came together with the end of the Cold War, the collapse of one of the superpower sponsors, which was the Soviet Union. So Saddam Hussein or Gaddafi's Libya, which had, or Assad in Syria, had all depended enormously on the Soviet Union for support, arms, aid, all of this collapses. And then the other superpower, the, the United States, feels less obliged to provide quite the same level of support and quite the same kind of carte blanche to a regime like Egypt that it had always done. So you're beginning to see all the, the scaffolding that has held these dictatorships in place start to wear off. And then, of course, the United States invades Iraq. The Arab Spring begins to threaten many of these other neighboring regimes. And what you begin to see is the regimes get challenged, and they begin to crack and crumble. But what's extraordinary about it is not just that the regimes crack and crumble. It's that when you get rid of the regimes, it turns out that there are no institutions of state that can maintain social order in these, in these societies underneath it. So the regime cracks, the state cracks. But then what you discover is when the state cracks, there are no, no great organizations of civic uh, or, or nature, civil society, that can maintain social order. So the regime cracks, the state cracks, civil society is absent. And what you then finally discover in many of these places is there's no country underneath it all. So if you look at what has happened to Syria or Iraq or Libya, these countries have essentially come apart. People wonder why the Iraqi army, which is 400,000 strong by some measure, if you take police forces uh, and add them in, trained by the Americans at the cost of 25 to $50 billion, equipped massively, how could it crumble in the face of a few thousand ISIS uh, terrorists? Well, it's not the Iraqi army that collapsed. There are plenty of people in Iraq who want to fight. The Kurds were passionately and uh, effectively fight for Kurdistan. The Shia were passionately and effectively fight for the Shia South. The Sunnis, when given a choice between fighting for a Shia government in Baghdad or fighting for ISIS, they're not quite sure. And many of them are actually more willing to fight with ISIS. So in other words, it's not that people aren't willing and able to fight in Iraq. There's just nobody who wants to fight for Iraq. So it's not the Iraqi army that collapsed. It's really Iraq that collapsed. And the Iraqi army is a manifestation of that collapse. And that reality is replicating itself in Syria, in Libya, where you see the, the latest tragedy of these boatloads of people trying to flee uh, and drowning off the coast of Europe. And that is the reality why you are seeing the simultaneous nature of violence and, and, and deprivation and destitution around this greater Middle East, why ISIS has been able to take advantage of it and gain ground in Syria and Iraq, why Yemen has uh, uh, turned into a, a civil war, why Libya has turned into an area of kind of warring tribes. But now if I would have painted this picture to you and said, have said, if I would have said to you two, two years ago, Here's what I'm going to paint. Syria is going to get much worse. You're going to have 5 million refugees, the largest refugee crisis since World War II. Iraq is going to start to, to, to get threatened. 
ISIS is going to take over major towns in Iraq, Fallujah, Ramadi, Mosul, Tikrit. Yemen is going to collapse as a country. Libya is going to collapse as a country. Now tell me, what do you think the price of oil would be? I can guarantee you, you would have all said $200, because there were lots of reports that predicted it would be $200 even before this geopolitical unrest. I mean, the, the Goldman Sachs put out a report, the IMF put out reports. Everybody was talking about targets like $150 and $200 a barrel. The price of oil today is, of course, closer to $50 a barrel. With all this geopolitical turmoil I've described, the world, you know, the, 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 the single indicator of political risk that you can find in this region, which is the price of oil, has collapsed. Why? The reason is basically that if you step back and ask yourself, aside from the Middle East, is the rest of the world in chaos? The answer is no. And the world has already discounted for the fact that the Middle East is in chaos. The Middle East has been in chaos for 10 years now. And there is a sense in which it is very difficult to add additional uh, discount to something which you had already assumed was messy. The Middle East is also economically not very consequential. So take oil out. If you look at the merchandise exports of the Middle East, it exports about what Finland exports. In other words, the 300 million people of the Middle East export about the same amount as Nokia does. Uh, that, that gives you a sense of the economic weight that the Middle East has absent the oil. And when you take the oil into account, you have to recognize the reality now, there are two great global realities that are shaping the nature of the oil market. The first is substantially increased US production of liquid hydrocarbons, uh, oil and, and gas, and substantially lower demand coming out of China. So for China, for the last 10 years, demand for oil, the increase in demand for oil year on year has been in the 7 to 10% range. Last year, demand for oil in China, the increase in demand for oil in China was zero. So these two realities are far more important in explaining the, the collapse of oil. But that larger reality that I described, which is if you step back from the Middle East and ask yourself how the rest of the world is doing, it is really remarkable what a different picture you get. If you look at Asia right now, across Asia what you are seeing is, you know, from India to Japan to Indonesia, new governments in place, trying to assert economic reform as a priority, trying to deepen their regional integration and their degree of global integration with uh, the, the world of markets, trade, commerce, investment. China trying to reform its economy, not clear exactly how far that's gone, but in general, a story of economic reform growth, uh, if you, to the extent that it matters, you look at governments like uh, the one in Indonesia, and India that have historically been quite, quite suspicious of the West and the United States, now much more comfortable with the West and the United States. So look at Latin America. Latin America is a continent that 30 years ago would have been characterized by lots of dictatorships, juntas, a lot of anti-market, anti-trade, traditional third world suspicions. Today, with the exception of Cuba, Venezuela, Ecuador, Bol Bolivia, it's almost a continent turned on its head. Every, every country is governed by a democracy, pro-market, pro-trade, pro-integration. If you want to see the single most dramatic transformation would be Mexico. Mexico was ruled by a country that defined itself by its anti-Americanism, its anti-market orientation. And today what you have is that same party, the, the Institutional Revolutionary Party, with a president who is trying his best to reform uh, uh, the, uh, the state sector and integrate more closely with the United States. I, I asked him when I met him, I said, um, it's sort of odd that you as the leader of the PRI are so pro-American and you're openly pro-American. And he said, Mexico is a transformed country. He said, 30 years ago, you would have probably de describe Mexico fundamentally as an anti-American country. Today, fundamentally, if you were to look at the character of Mexico, it's a pro-American country. Everybody wants wants to deal with America, has dealings with America, and wants to enhance and, and, and expand those dealings. Africa. If you look at Africa today, what is striking about it again is the degree to which there has been change. Of course, Africa is a messy, complex place, a lot of corruption, a lot of 
difficulties. But if you ask yourself, 30 years ago, you were talking about the Africa of Idi Amin, of Mobutu, uh, of apartheid, uh, an Africa that was really politically and economically going nowhere. And today, it is an Africa that is growing. Of, you know, there are the various ways you can count these things. But of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world in the last couple of years, seven have been out of Africa. If you look at African economies, about 30 of them have, are growing at 3% a year or more. Half of those not because of commodities, but because of in, intrinsic economic growth. So this, the picture of the world when you step back uh, and put the Middle East in perspective is one of much greater globalization, interdependence, uh, trade, and, and, and positive movement. The two big trends that are dominating the world and have dominated the world really since 1990 have been globalization and the information revolution. Right? If you think about it, these are the two things after the fall of the Soviet Union that have defined and described the world. And it is their deepening power that you are going to live with throughout your working, uh, your, your working age. Look at globalization. People worry that it's slowing down. People worry that there's the rise of uh, economic nationalism. This is all true. Uh, but consider the reality that you're dealing with, which is most of the world is already connected. Tariffs in the industrialized world, the average tariff in the industrialized world today is 3%. So it would be nice if there were more global trade agreements and there were more global trade rounds. But you're not going to get much more bang uh, at this point. So the Doha trade round, which everyone talks about, if it were completed, would have the effect of adding $500 billion to the global economy, which sounds like a large number if you're a person. But the global economy is somewhere in the range of $55 trillion. $500 billion really is a sign of how little added benefit the Doha trade round would get. And by the way, I'm in favor of it. My point is just when you're at 3% average uh, uh, tariffs, you can't get that much more bang for the buck. The reality that you are facing is that more and more things are being globalized in more and more different ways so that it's easier to globalize because of the internet. It's easier to globalize because of cheaper communications. It's becoming easier to globalize because of cheaper transport. All those realities exist. The second piece of this is the information revolution, which is also deepening, and, and deepening in a way that is probably going to be the more dramatic change in the next 10 years uh, than, than, uh, than globalization. Information technology has now reached a kind of critical mass because it, the, the world of uh, uh, the, the industrial world and the post-industrial world are now being dominated not by hardware but by software. There's a very good piece by Mark Andreessen, might have been a blog post, but it was a, like a 6,000 word blog post in which he, he talked about how software is eating the world. And the point he was trying to make is that everything now has software attached to it. Whether it's an industrial lathe, whether it's a cab, you know, think of Uber, uh, whether it's, a, it's a, a, a bed and breakfast, there is some software on top of it which is creating efficiencies. Now, the reason that becomes very important is that hardware can only improve in productivity on a certain, you know, uh, a predictable uh, level. A, a lathe in, 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 a, in a machine tool shop can improve 10% a year. But software improves by Moore's law, right? It doubles in capacity every 18 months. And so the warp speed efficiency you are now going to get out of things that are connected to software, by which we mean everything, is much, much greater than it used to be when it was just hardware. And that that is why you are seeing this revolutionizing effect taking place where hardware is meeting software, where the world of atoms is meeting the world of bits and bytes, as Travis Kalanick, the CEO of Uber, puts it. That reality uh, is going to shape your life. And software is going to continue to improve. In fact, there are these theories that say software is going to improve at a greater pace than it has ever uh, done before. This is the, the, uh, the Second Machine Age, that wonderful book by two business school professors, by the way, um, that, that, that really gets into why you are moving into this accelerated return in terms of software. And it's basically because you've reached a critical mass where the, 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 you know, you're now doubling from a very, very high base. So that the phone that is in your pocket, and some of you are actually looking at furtively, I can tell, um, <laughs> 
the phone that is in your pocket has a hundred times the computing power of the computing system that took human beings to the moon and back, the Apollo space model. It has 100 times that capacity. And it will double in 18 months. So then you ask yourself, what are the possibilities in, you know, that, information, that the information revolution provides in that, in that world? So those are the two great forces you are gonna, you're gonna be uh, grappling with for your whole lives. And let me close by saying the great challenge that, that, that you will face as a result of it is that inevitably and, and almost necessarily the result of this is going to be um, a very dramatic two-tierization of the economy that has already happened. Uh, and you can see it almost any country you go to. Right? The, the reality is that for the people who have capital, this is a fantastic world I've just described. You can play a global arbitrage game of finding cheap labor, finding cheap capital, finding ways in which you can, uh, you can sell into, into, into markets with high demand, source in markets with low costs, find capital that's cheap. Wonderful arbitrage game. What do you do if you're the average worker? The average worker faces these same two challenges of information revolution and globalization as a pincer movement on his or her wages. Because anything he or she can do can be done now by a machine or somebody in China. I'm exaggerating, of course, but that is the reality. And that dramatic impact that is going to be felt by the average Western worker and increasingly by the average educated worker in, in, in developing countries is the great challenge that this new economy provides. How do you find industries, jobs where you actually have employment, where you have rising levels of, of income? The, the, the discussion about inequality, I think, is all premised on the idea that there was, a, uh, there, there was a golden age of inequality, which was about the 1950s, which was the standard. I don't think that that's true, unfortunately or fortunately. If you look back at 1920s, 1890s, 1860s, the world has had lots of inequality. Uh, if you go to Paris and go to Versailles and consider the fact that that entire compound was built for one person, I, I would say the Gini coefficient in France in 1790 was probably very high, right? <laughs> and so that reality is one that we're pro you know, we may be returning to, not Versailles itself, but I mean the reality of very widening uh, 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 disparities in wealth and income and opportunity, but a political system that is very different from the one in the 1790s, a political system in which the vast majority have participation and so how you navigate this, even if you're looking at it just from the point of view of business, is going to be one of the great challenges you will face. I, I, I want to just finally close by saying I know that that leaves us with a, 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 a kind of uh, a problem. But I really am an optimist because I believe that these two great forces are powerful, progressive forces. They are lifting hundreds of millions of people out of, out of poverty. They are allowing people to participate in a system, in a global system from which they were shut out for decades, maybe centuries. And so you have to look at this from the point of view of the extraordinary new opportunities that it provides. Yes, it throws up important problems that have to be dealt with. But you know, if you think about the last 100 years and think about the challenges the generation before you, your parents, their grandparents had to deal with, well, what were they like? They were, World War I and the collapse of three of, of the largest empires in the world, the Great Depression, hyperinflation, World War II, Nazism, the rise of communism, uh, the great uh, leap forward in the Cultural Revolution in China. Uh, you know, that was, that was the last 75 years. So the problem you have to deal with is extraordinary technological innovation, extraordinary globalization, which throws up problems of inequality. I think I'd take this, this generation's challenges over the past generations any day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. That was great, terrific remarks. I'd like to pick up on the penultimate issue that you raised and, and just start by observing. I think most, most of us would, would agree that human capital is the most important form of capital in the modern economy and modern societies and even in developing countries. And we had a, a question 
uh, from a speaker earlier in the year, Ian Cook, who heads up uh, Colgate, Palmolive. And I, I'll just give a shout out to, to Ian. I think he works really hard on issues of, uh, of globalization and does a really great job with his company. But he, he couldn't be here, but he, he, he asked the following question of you that I think is very relevant to this issue that you raise about the tiering, the haves and the have-nots is one way to put it, but I think you put it differently, more the people who can get traction than the people who can't in, in terms of this, you know, the, the, these very dynamic forces going on. So this is Ian Cook to, to, to you, Fareed. When you look at employers, governments, different types of enterprises, universities, acting effectively to build human capital in the developing markets, what exactly are they doing well? And what, if anything, are they typically failing to do? Oh, that's a great question. So what I think they're doing very well is they are attracting um, talent in a very meritocratic way, probably more meritocratic than at any point in the past. That if you look at the incredibly rigorous way that a big bank now selects people. Uh, if you look at the way in which you know, organizations have metrics for promotion, they're really trying very hard to do this in a way that's not an old boy network that isn't based on you know, contacts and nepotism, that's, that, that really tries to figure out what is the best human talent here. And they're doing it for selfish reasons, to be, fair, to be frank. That's because you really do, as you say, the premium is on human talent. They do that very well by and large. What they do very badly is develop human talent. They, they, they are very bad at taking people who may not start out quite so well and finding a way to really develop and encourage that process. A, a, an organization that does that paradoxically very well is the US military. If you go and have an interaction with the US military at the level of one star, two star generals, the thing that always strikes me about this is they, because they, in very military fashion, they give you everybody's bio and they're usually one page. These, if, if I can be totally honest, these people have gone to colleges I've never heard of. I mean, literally, these are colleges that are not in the top 100. Um, and yet, they're all smart, bright, and if you look at their record of accomplishment, they've really done a lot. And what that tells me is that the institution they have been in has really worked at developing their talent, encouraging them, discouraging certain kinds of behavior, sending them for one-year programs in places like, uh, like the, uh, this and Harvard and hundreds of other institutions. And they're very good at that. And why are they so good at that? And why are companies so bad at it? I'm not sure, but I think one for one, it, you know, they really have control of your life in a way that companies don't. I mean, that is a cradle-to-grave socialist system, the US Army. For all you lovers of free enterprise who still admire the US Army, you have to keep in mind, this is the world's last surviving socialist organization. And I am including the Chinese government in that, in that list. <laughs> um, the, the, China doesn't provide health care to its people. The US, you know, the US Army has a whole you know, massive edifice of, uh, of all these benefit programs. Secondly, they, they, they really have patience and time, which maybe companies don't. Uh, and so they are able to look to the long term. They are able to do it. Third, they have very clear uh, metrics that, you know, that they are trying to achieve that are not uh, academic. And they are really much more real world even than companies might have. So they have, you know, there's something they're doing. And I offer these as just thoughts. That, uh, that suggests that they know how to do this a little bit better. And I think it is a very important challenge because you know, not everyone can be a software engineer. I mean, it's, look, if you're going to be a software engineer, you're going to be fine. Everyone knows that. But what happens to the tens and tens of millions of people who are not in that position? And I think that somebody like uh, Howard Schultz at Starbucks really understands this and is trying to figure out because, again, for good selfish reasons and the way that you know, business can often be a win-win for society, 
he, he wants to try to figure out how he takes his people and really develops their, their human capital. But the whole hospitality industry, by the way, is a perfect example of an area where we re you really could find that, that middle class that's getting hollowed out. You don't need a lot of education. You can be a high school graduate. You start as a bellboy, and you end up a captain or maitre d' at a restaurant at the Waldorf Astoria in New York, you'd be making $150,000 a year. You know, that's three times the median income. It's not bad for somebody in that situation. Those are the kind of jobs you have to create, and that's the development that companies need to try to focus on. So this, this is the uh, third anniversary of the Global Network, and I'm going to turn to my colleague, Anjani Jain, Senior Associate Dean, because I know we have some questions that, that came in from my counterparts at Global Network Schools. Great. The first question comes from Dr. Inase Okonedo, who is Dean of the Lagos Business School, Pan Atlantic University. And I quote. Where is that? In Lagos, Nigeria. Oh, Lagos. Lagos. Yeah, so, so we have LBS in, yeah. in the network, yeah. but it's a different LBS. Yeah. <laughs> this, this used to be called the Pan African University now called the Pan-Atlantic University. I quote, should the tools that you refer to in your book in defense of a liberal education as, quote, immeasurably valuable, that is, how to learn, how to write, and how to speak your mind, be considered the most valuable tools in emerging economies with high growth rates, rapid changes in the nature of business, and sometimes challenging, unstable business environments? Or are these tools useful, but not necessarily the most valuable in these contexts? That's a very, very interesting and good question. Um, so the point I make in the book is that, you know, the ability to think analytically, to uh, learn, to learn how to learn, to uh, speak your mind, these are, these are incredibly important skills uh, in, in a country like the United States, because that's where you add the value. And the question is really, well, what about the places where you are doing routine manufacturing? You know, I point out, you can make a $30 pair of sneakers anywhere in the world, but if you want to sell it for $300, you have to build a story around it, you have to design it, you have to create a brand, you have to figure out the marketing. Yeah, but what about the country where they're making the $30 sneaker? I think that it's fair to say that in those places, there is a greater, there is a greater value to there is a great value to routine manufacturing, to routine, uh, you know, what we call commoditized labor, but there it remains high quality labor. Um, and so I think that that would certainly be true in Nigeria. It is probably not true for LBS graduates, because at the top of any of these societies, because the world we now live in, that two tierization I've been describing is happening everywhere. So that if you're going to go to the Indian business school or go to LBS, you are likely going to be dealing with multinational companies or multinational sources of funding or multinational sources of uh, you know, uh, 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 destinations for your export. And you are going to be, at the very least, interacting with that world of value add where the skills I describe are very important. You have to have a healthy appreciation for the kind of work that you know, is, is being done that is filling the factories of Nigeria. But it's highly unlikely that you, as an LBS graduate, are going to go and do, you know, going to make sneakers at thirty dollars. So in those countries, you 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 already live in this very bizarre um, two tiers, where one part, you know, where one if you go to lay, I was in Lagos a year and a half ago, or, uh, and I was talking to these private equity guys who could have been running, a, you know, their business out of London. I mean, they were that quality. You walk out of that room and you go in, onto the streets of Nigeria and it lo lo uh, Lagos and it looks like you're in Bangladesh. And that's the reality they live with all the time. So for them probably, they're gonna have to learn to appreciate both simultaneously. So this answer gets at a complementarity between liberal education and these more practical skills. And I must say, I, I found your book intriguing and not surprising having graduated from Yale College. You're aware that when, when people say liberal education, in some cases, it's quite narrow what people th think about. And if, having gone to Yale, do you have advice for Yale College students 
Uh, that's not our primary audience today, but what's the optimal investment in practical knowledge as you're going through the early stages of your life? You say that engineering is a, you know, it's an honored, valuable profession. Should you take an engineering class to understand the nature of those complementarities as you're going to a place like Yale, or is it just, you know, some, some, some of my colleagues, I'm sure, around Yale would say, no, this is too high an opportunity cost. Yeah, it's a fascinating question, of what, because at the heart of a liberal education is science. It has always been at the heart of a liberal education. Even the term liberal arts, people mistakenly assume it means humanities. The arts was a reference, you know, historically, this is way back, to, to a, the distinction between arts and crafts, meaning trades, specific narrow trades like welding that you would do. Science was always part of the arts because it was seen as a search for knowledge. In fact, in the old days, people studied science for the exact opposite reason that they study it now. It used, now you're told to study it because it's practical, it'll get you a good job. You used to study it because it was a way of exploring abstract knowledge. I mean, until 1700, science had no practical application. There was nothing you could do with science. When Aristotle and you know, uh, all these guys were studying science, they were just trying to understand the world, understand human bodies, understand. So in a strange sense, you know, we should remember that things, things go in waves. In those days, studying law and rhetoric and, and, and you know, things like that was, was the practical stuff that would get you jobs in the world. And science was abstract. Today, it's perhaps a little bit the reverse. What, Yale, what any uh, general student should do, I believe, is learn the scientific method. I don't know that it's that important that you learn engineering, because that, that, that's a hard thing to do unless you're an engineer. But I think you know, the Yale-Singapore uh, model is a very, very smart idea where they take, they, they've tried to create modes of scientific inquiry as required courses. So one class you take is in observational science. How do scientists who observe natural phenomena formulate hypotheses, test them, and record evidence. How do people who engage in experimental science do it? Um, my own favorite course that would be required for everyone is statistics, because I think that you know, it's a course I was required to take in graduate school. I would never have taken it if I didn't. It changes the way you read the newspaper, the way you understand life. I mean, everything that you hear, you are inundated with the misuse of statistics. You know, any time somebody says to you, studies have shown, you should reach for your wallet because the chair, you know, the, what kind of study? How was it constructed? What was the standard deviation? What was the sample size? You know, the result of that, of course, is a study can show anything if you don't know how it has been constructed. And most people don't understand statistics. So I'll give you a simple example. If, you were, if, I, if I were to ask you, you need about 1,000 people to do a poll in the United States, right? Uh, China has four times the population of the United States. How many people do you need for, to create an optimal sample size for China? The routine answer everyone will give you is 4,000 people. That is not true. You need a, because it is a question of the quality of the selection that produces the sample size. You can use 1,000 people is more than enough to get, a, to get a representative poll in China. You know, just stuff like that, which would help you understand how to read the newspapers. Uh, that kind of practical knowledge, I think, is. Not, is not at the heart of a liberal education, to be honest, but it, it, it is something that we should layer on. So I would put things like that more than I would put electrical engineering, which, you, you know, it's hard to do. And when, when you try to get scientists to teach these courses, they all resist, by the way. They all feel like it's good our courses are hard. We're not going to teach physics for poets. We want, we want to weed out people who are not that serious about it because we don't have time. We're trying to teach trained physicists here. So th that's why you've got to come up with the sweet spot where you say to them, yeah, but how about if you teach people how to think like a physicist in their, in their lives? What are the core um, you know, methods of inquiry that you use? So the example you gave of statistics and, the, and focusing on scientific method focuses exactly on that, if I'm listening correctly. It's not so much figuring out the right idea from various disciplines. That, that's probably not the best thing to invest in. But figuring out how to think to get to the best idea or to evaluate the current best answers 
and when might those ideas be rejected, that's very consistent with the, with the critical thinking that, yeah. that you think is the most important for the long run. Is that a fair? Yeah, exactly. And, and by the way, the same is true in the humanities. I don't think it actually matters what book you read, but the ability to learn how to read a text and figure out you know, what, is the, what, what, is, what are the insights in this text? What is the author trying to say? What would be the, the, you know, the, uh, another way to look at it? How would you turn this on its head? That skill to, of manipulating words is incredibly powerful. The ability in an art history or design class to look at something visually and translate it into words or translate it in some way, that's a very powerful uh, you know, a, a skill to have. And that's why Steve Jobs says the most important academic course he ever took in his life was a calligraphy course at Reed. Because it taught him something about design and about how you combine design with technology that he had never thought about before. So let's get uh, Anjani. Do we have another question from the network? This <clears throat> second question actually echoes a number of the themes that you just went through and perhaps is partly answered, but I, let me repeat it. It comes from um, Professor Miriam Erez, who's vice dean of the MBA program at the Technion, Israel sure, sure. Institute of Technology. I quote, as you say, liberal education existed in the days of Cicero, but with no progress and no help to humanity, echoing what you said. Uh, I'm convinced that there is a need to balance the two in order for humanity to progress. A focus on one track is necessary but not sufficient. How do you recommend that societies balance liberalism with science, technology, and vocational education? It's a, you know, it's a tough balance, and I don't know enough about Technion, but MIT is actually does, does more than people realize. I mean, you have to take, roughly speaking, about one quarter of your, of your classes at MIT in non in non-STEM fields. Uh, and so there is this very strong effort to ensure that there is a broadening of people. And of course, if you are an engineer, uh, en engineering student at a place like Yale or Princeton, there, that, that, that's even more true. Uh, I, I'm not sure I would entirely agree with the characterization that, uh, that we have had no progress. Uh, you know, I, I tend to be, I'm more of the Steven Pinker view of, uh, of the progress of humanity. And I think if you look back over the last 400 years, the way human beings treat other human beings, the eradication of slavery, the eradication of serfdom, the transformation of gender relations, the, you know, the civil rights movements in various parts of the world, decolonization, these are all advances that have taken place because of core insights that came out of the humanities and the social sciences. Uh, and it's easy to say, well, we've, you know, we haven't learned anything since Cicero. And that would be true if you were a rich white man like Cicero. But I think that for many other people, that would not be exactly their experience of, of human history. Uh, that said, I think, look, there's no question that since the Industrial Revolution, the great transformation that's taken place in our lives has been the impact of science and its ability to transform the world. Uh, I, I think that it's unfortunate that we don't, we haven't figured out how to, how to more centrally integrate it. I point out in the book, it used to be integrated because everyone thought this is all God's work. And this is, oh, these are all you know, uh, manifestations of God's genius, and so we have to study them. There must be a unified field theory of knowledge because there is a unified creator. Well, since that's him, most people don't quite believe that anymore, this has been more compartmentalized and created, turned into silos, which is unfortunate. I'm not saying we have to return to a worship, worshipful attitude towards the, the deity, but I'm saying that it would be nice if we could try to figure out a way to reintegrate the sciences into this, into this conversation. It, it is, uh, you know, C.P. Snow says this in his two cultures, that you can ask somebody, um, something about Shakespeare, and if they can't answer it, you would be correct in assuming that person is basically not educated. But if you ask them, what is uh, you know, Newton's second law, and they don't know it, nobody thinks anything of it. And if you ask them what a chromosome is and how it's different from a gene, n people think it would be completely normal for the well-educated person to have no idea. And that's, that's unfortunate, and that, you know, that should be something that colleges 
uh, integrate much more. As I say, at Yale, uh, the uh, NUS, uh, in Singapore, there is a much greater emphasis on science. I think when I was at Yale, there were two courses you were required to take. I frankly think it should be more like four or six because it, there really is a sense in which people can get through an undergraduate experience without knowing much about the forces that are actually transforming the world that they are living in, you know, the world that they, that they interact in daily. I mean, I, it's an interesting question of whether or not there's some, it would be useful to have an introduction in computer science or coding or something like that as part of, you know, we all, most colleges require a second language. Computers are in a sense a third language that you use probably with greater frequency than that second language. Uh, why, not, why not think about it in those terms? As you might uh, remember, uh, Fareed, in many PhD programs, the second or third language requirement in the technical fields has been transformed to a computer language. That's right. Uh, uh, many of our students uh, know Klaus Kleinfeld who runs Alcoa because he's been involved in our orientations. And he had a question about uh, senior executives, especially in the global context. Um, today's world uh, picks up on your, your themes, your, your two big uh, ongoing changes in the world. Today's world seems to require from CEOs that they cater to a broad range of constituencies in multiple regions. How do you train for this? Or might there be certain personality characteristics that are crucial for success? Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, a very, it's a very interesting uh, question because one of the things that always struck me, Ted, you and I were talking about, about this uh, before we, we came here, is that people who are deans and presidents of uh, colleges and universities and schools, I think are usually it's much better training for being in Washington or in, in politics than being a CEO. Because a CEO arrives in Washington and he thinks he's the boss, if he's, say, Secretary of Defense, right? And he thinks if he says something, it should happen. Well, the first rule you realize in Washington is nobody is the boss, right? The, so you're the Secretary of Defense. Well, guess what? The Chairman of the House Armed Services Committee thinks he's your boss. The Chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee thinks he's your boss. The 27-year-old guy at the White House who is liaising between you and the president thinks he's your boss. The press is going to hold you accountable for every word you say, and every foreign ally you have is going to constantly pressure you to do what, you, what they want you to do. In that environment, having been a CEO is sometimes not the best training. You know? And I think you could see that with somebody like Donald Rumsfeld. There's a, there's a the reality to, you know, you're the, uh, I think it was Truman. Truman says when Eisenhower gets elected a president, he says, poor Ike, he has no idea what he's in for. He's going to pick up the phone and say, do this, do that, and he's going to put the phone down and not realize nothing is going to happen. <laughs> you know, that the idea of you giving an order in the army and you just assume that it's kind of executed, well, it's a slight exaggeration of what Eisenhower had to deal, deal with. You know, when you would, you would do that and you'd be calling the British nothing would happen either, and Eisenhower would have to negotiate with them. But that reality is now becoming more true for CEOs, actually. I think that it, the, the reality is that CEOs are going to have to learn more of these political skills that people uh, you know, like Ted and have had to deal with all the time. The, the reason I talk about university administrators is because they, they have enormous responsibilities without great power. Right? Other than, you know, you can't, hire, you can't really single-handedly hire anybody in the faculty. You can't fire them. You can't give them much, you know, much of a raise. You can't redirect them in terms of their work assignments. Other than that, you're the boss. Right? If you think to yourself, that is not a very normal job description for a CEO. But increasingly, where you have a world in which you have joint ventures, you have all these, uh, these new constituents, you, you have a public that you have to deal with. You, you have to have that ability. I would say to my mind, though, that the biggest challenge for a CEO in today's world, uh, in certainly developed markets with public markets, is to focus on the long term. Uh, the ability to be, to be able to figure out how to focus your, yourself on long term potential for your company, it's very hard. I'll give you a simple example. One of the big puzzles in the United States remains why is it that businesses are not investing? Right? Businesses have more money 
than God right now. They have more than $1 trillion on their balance sheets. The economy has clearly recovered, so you can't even say it's because they, they're in a slump, and yet they're not spending money. Normally what you do in these situations is you start spending money because you f worry that you're going to lose market share, then the other guy spends money because he's worried that he's going to lose market share, and you end up in a kind of competitive CapEx uh, spending mode. None of that is happening. And nobody, honestly, there's a big puzzle as to why this is happening. So I have a simple theory, which is micro, not macro, by which I mean just based on my observation of uh, CEOs. So you have two choices as a CEO. You can either make a series of big investments in products, f countries, facilities, ideas that may or may not, may not pan out over the next 10 to 15 years, right? Because that's what big investments are going to likely uh, look like. Or you can use your money and buy back shares or issue dividends. If you buy back shares and issue dividends, here's the one thing you can be sure. Stock analysts will be very happy with you. And anyone getting paid in stock and options will be very happy with you, which means your senior management and your board of directors. Now you tell me, which are you going to do? Right? Overwhelmingly, what you see is companies doing the second, not the first. And is it so surprising, given that the incentive structure is one that it's very hard? And yet, the only way you're going to get real sustained growth decade after decade, the way you're going to truly maintain market leadership or build to market leadership is having that long-term focus. And I think that's why the great CEOs are people who are often you know, kind of oddballs. They have, a, they have a slightly different perspective. They're contrarian. They're willing to take uh, to, to zig when everybody else is zagging. That's the hardest one to figure out how you, how you develop. So unfortunately, we don't have much time. And I apologize to everyone who has lots of questions. But um, what, ad what advice do you have for students around the network? Um, one of the things that happens when you go to a top business school, whether it's in you know, Ireland or, or the Philippines or in Ghana, um, you get focused on what's happening in your own environment. And you get focused on your teammates, your faculty, your classes. What, what ends up being the most important thing is your calendar, yeah. which is typically filled up with stuff that's compelling. And then if you happen to have a great university around, then there's that. Oh, and then there's, oh yeah, get a job. Um, so how do you, you know, if, if you take the point of view of the student and match it up to the question about how do you get ready for being a, a senior executive of various kinds of enterprises, how do you start to organize your life, position yourself? What habits should you take on? Look, I, I can give you a, a, a kind of laundry list of the obvious things that you should do, work hard, uh, learn how to, how to work with other people. I think that part, the social skill involved is very, very important. But I think that the most important thing I would, I would tell you is follow your curiosity now. Really follow your curiosity. Uh, go deep into things you're interested in. Spend the time, take the time to cultivate those curiosities. And I really don't care what they are, because here's the reality of your life. At this point in your life, time is not your most valuable resource. Let's face it, you're students, OK? Um, but it will soon be. And at that point, you will never have the time to do what I'm describing. You will be surprised at the degree to which you will really very quickly get to a point where you just don't have time because you have a real job and very soon you will have real families. And between those two obligations, it is very difficult to cultivate a new passion, to cultivate a new interest, to follow your, you know, your curiosity. And whatever it is, whether it's physics, whether it's traveling to a certain country, whether it's learning something, whether it's reading a series you know, a, a deeply in some subject, Really allow yourself to do that. Don't think of it as an indulgence. Think of it as something you're doing, uh, an investment in out-of-the-box thinking, an investment in figuring out how to learn, because you really will not have a chance to do it again. I'm 51 years old, 
And I can tell you the, the times that I, the, the time I spent in my 20s in graduate school goofing off were probably the most valuable things that I did because they, you know, they allowed me to do things at a scale, a pace, uh, without a kind of a, a clear benefit in sight that I have never been able to do again. You know, that when I read now, I am reading for a purpose. And I'm lucky in that I get to do a lot of, you know, very wide reading. But even then, I have to ask myself, you know, how much time can I devote to this? Because I've got to get back to the next column, the next show, the next special, the next book. If you can really do that, you'll do yourself a favor, first of all, in, at, at work. But also, you know, you're at that stage where this is your last chance. You've got 40, 50 years of work. You don't know how it's going to go. It's going to, you're going to change jobs. You're going to change industries. But you've also got 60 or 70 years as a human being before you. And you're going to have to live that life. And I can tell you some of the most puzzled people I know are senior executives at age 75 who have now been retired for 10 years and literally don't know what to do with their days. Um, and so, you know, and the, and the answer to it, by the way, is there's only so much golf you can play. <laughs> and so you really want to think about building a whole life. <laughs> so that's a great answer. I, I'm going to, um, having, having uh, watched you from afar and gotten, you, gotten to know you a little bit in person, um, I'll just say maybe two things that I see in you that I think are valuable to others. One is, I alluded to it in my introduction of you. You're an optimist. Uh, you know, you've got a little bit of, of uh, Walter Cronkite in you, I think. When I used to watch him cover the, the space launches, he was in awe. You really enjoy all this stuff out there. And there's, a, it, it, there's an excitement about that that discovery process, that curiosity. It's not, it's not narrow, it's broad. And I think that's something that uh, we all could, could benefit from you know, enjoying things. Change is tough, but uh, you seem to embrace this, this stuff that's oftentimes dizzying. And then secondly, you, Fareed is probably the best listener, best connector, out there, and I think that's something else. This is not a solid, solitary endeavor on your part. Well, I don't learn much by, by talking. Right? Right? Well, I, know, I know what I think, and, and it, but it's, you're right. It's very important, and it's as, you, as, you, as you move up, it's even more important because, you know, look at the situation. For me, you know, you, and as you know, we spend an hour and a half uh, with the, uh, the senior faculty, and I was mostly listening, because frankly, to me, that's much more interesting. I know what I think. Well, we benefited from listening today. <laughs> With that, I want to thank everyone online, thank everyone throughout the network, thank all the people who made this event possible, and thank all of you here at Yale, and most importantly, thanks to Fareed Zakaria. Thank you.